From Pedro's Journal by Pam Conrad Background In August 1492, Christopher Columbus and his crew set sail from Spain in search of a western route to India. Months passed without a hint of land. Hopelessness and anger spread throughout the crew until they came upon a new world on the other side of the ocean. Pedro's Journal is a fictionalized account of that difficult voyage. August 3rd. The ship's roster of the Santa Maria has me down as Pedro de Celcida, ship's boy, and the captain of the ship, who calls himself Captain General of the Ocean Sea, has hired me not for my great love of the sea, nor for my seamanship, but because I have been taught to read and write, and he thinks it will be useful to have me along. Last night, when I boarded the Santa Maria with forty others, and made ready to begin this uncertain journey to India, I saw my mother standing alone on the dock, wrapped in her black shawl. She lifted her hand to wave, and I turned away quickly. I have never been away from our home. I have never been on a ship as great as this one. I dedicate this journal, this parcel of letters and drawings, to my dear mother, who has lost so much, and who I pray will not lose me as well. Me, her young boy, whom she calls Pedro de mi Corazon, Pedro of my heart. We are a fleet of three ships, the Nina and the Pinta with us, and this morning in the darkness, with no one watching or waving goodbye, we left the harbor at Palos and headed out for the sandbar of the Salts River. There we waited for tide and wind and then made way for the Canary Islands. We are to be the first ships ever to run a course west to the Indies. Marco Polo's land where palaces are built of gold, where mandarins wear silk brocade and pearls are the size of ripened grapes. A couple of the men are seasick and are already mumbling that we will never see this India our Captain General is so certain he will find. Me? I have no knowledge of maps or charts or distant journeys. I am only a ship's boy. There are three of us, and I am beginning to suspect that we will do all the work no one wants to do. But already the captain favors me, and has called upon me to write and to copy certain of his writings. I believe he is testing me, and will find I am capable and write a good hand. The captain told me he was pleased to see my stomach is as strong as my handwriting, and has encouraged me to sketch some of the things I see around me. Perhaps I am a natural seaman, although I admit that looking over the side of this creaking ship into the swelling water can fill me with terror. September 10th. Everyone seemed crazy all day. No one is doing his job well. Even the helmsman steered improperly and took us north instead of west. I thought the captain would string up the whole crew to the mast. What do you think you are doing, he shouted. Steering a ferry boat across the river of Seville? I've seen him go into white rages and then pace his small cabin, saying his Hail Marys. We finally lost sight of land as we sailed west. Some say it will be a long time before we see it again, if at all. A couple of the men were crying, and the captain shamed them and then promised them all sorts of riches and fame. He has said that the first man to spot land will receive a reward of 10,000 maravedis. The men listen to him sullenly, and I see them exchange glances. They don't believe him, and after what I saw this morning, I wonder if they should. I noted that the morning slate said we made 180 miles, and yet the captain recorded only 144 in his official log that the men see. I believe he is trying to make the crew believe that we are closer to home than is true. The 10,000 maravedis? Ah, think of all I could buy for my mother. Even now I can picture a beautiful dress, a rich dress that she could wear to Mass or Easter. I will keep a sharp eye. I will be the first to spot land. October 10th. This has been the worst day of all for the captain. I am certain of this. We have doubled all previous records of days and leagues at sea, and we've gone way past the point where he originally said we would find land. There is nothing out here. Surely we are lost and everyone is certain now as well. This morning, the men responded slowly to orders, 
scowling and slamming down their tools and lines. They whispered in pairs and small groups on deck and below. The air was thick with mutiny and betrayal, until finally everything came to a dead stop. The wind howled through the shrouds, and the men just stood there on deck and did not move aside when Columbus came. Enough, one of the men said to his face. This is enough. Now we turn back. The other men grumbled their assent and nodded, their fists clenched, their chests broad, and they remained motionless and unmoved while Columbus paced the deck, telling them how close he figured we must be, that land could be right over the next horizon. He told them again of the fame and fortune that would be theirs if they could only last a little longer, and they laughed at him, the cruel laughter of impatient and defeated men. All that aside, he added, with the fresh easterly wind coming at us and the rising sea, we can't turn a course back to Spain right now. We would stand still in the water. I looked up at the sails, full and straining, taking us farther and farther from Spain. What if a westerly wind never came? What if we were just blown away forever and ever? Let me offer you this, Columbus finally said. Do me this favor. Stay with me this day and night, and if I don't bring you to land before day, cut off my head, and you shall return. The men glanced at each other. Some nodded. One day, they said. One day. And then we turn around. That is all I ask, Columbus said. Later, when I went down to the cabin with the log, the captain's door was bolted shut, and when I knocked, he didn't answer so I sat outside the door with the heavy journal in my lap and waited. October 11th. Through the day, the day that was to have been our last day traveling westward, many things were seen floating in the water, things that stirred everyone's hopes and had the men once again scanning the horizon. We saw birds and flocks, reeds and plants floating in the water, and a small floating board and even a stick was recovered that had iron workings on it, obviously man-made. Suddenly, no one wished to turn around. There was no further word on it. At sunset, I led the prayers, and the men sang the Sal Virginia. When the captain spoke to the seamen from the stern castle, doubling the night watch and urging everyone to keep a sharp lookout, no one asked about turning back. Then the captain added a new bonus to his reward of 10,000 maravedis. He added a silk doublet, and some of the men joked with each other. Next the captain nodded to me, and I sang for the changing of the watch, that my words were lost in the wind that was growing brisker and the seas that were growing heavier, and sounding like breakers all about us. The men dispersed to their watches and their bunks, and the captain paced the deck. I don't know why, but this night I stayed with him. I stayed still by the gunwale, searching over the side. Once in a while he would stand beside me, silent, looking westward, always westward. Then, an hour before moonrise, the captain froze beside me. Guterres, he called to one of the king's men on board who came running. He pointed out across the water. What do you see? Gutierrez peered into the west. I don't see anything, he said. What? What? What do you see? Can't you see it? The captain whispered. The light, like a little wax candle, rising and falling. The man at his side was quiet. I was there beside him, too, straining my own eyes to the dark horizon. Suddenly, another seaman called out across the darkness, Land! Land! He's already seen it, I shouted. My master's already seen it and the captain laughed and tousled my hair. Tierra! Tierra! It was heard all across the water from all three ships. I am below now in the captain's cabin riding, while in the light of the rising moon, with our sails silver in the moonlight, we three exploring ships are rolling and plunging through the swells toward land. Tomorrow our feet will touch soil, and I can assure my dear mother in the hills of Spain that no one will get much sleep on board the Santa Maria tonight. October 12th. A lush green island was there in the morning, and our three ships approached it carefully, maneuvering through breakers and a threatening barrier reef. 
We could see clear down to the reef in the sparkling blue waters as we sailed through. And ah, it is truly land, truly earth, here so far from Spain. The Santa Maria led the way into the sheltered bay of the island and got a mark of only five fathoms step. We anchored there and barely paused to admire the breathtaking beauty. Small boats were prepared, armed, and lowered, and in these some of us went ashore. Out of respect, all waited while Christopher Columbus leaped out of the boat, his feet the first to touch this new land. I wondered what my mother would say if she knew her son had lost the ten thousand maravedes to the captain, who claimed it for himself. The captain carried the royal banner of our king and queen, and as everyone else scrambled out of the boats and secured them in the white sand, he thrust the banner into the earth and then sank down to his knees and said a prayer of thanksgiving for our safe arrival in India. Others dropped to their knees around him. Diego was beside me, and he clapped his hand on my shoulder. I knew he was happy to be on land again. I was, too, although I have been at sea so long that even on land the ground seems to buckle and sway beneath my feet. The captain made a solemn ceremony and formally took possession of the land for the king and queen, naming it San Salvador. We all witnessed this, and then little by little we noticed something else. There were people stepping out from the trees, beautiful, strong, naked people, with tan skin and straight black hair. My mother would have lowered her eyes or looked away, as I have seen her do in our home when someone dresses, but I could not take my eyes off them. Some had boldly painted their bodies or their faces, some only their eyes, some their noses. They were so beautiful and gentle, they walked towards us slowly, but without fear, smiling and reaching out their hands. The sailors watched them in wonder, and when these people came near, the crew gave them coins, little red caps, whatever they had in their pockets. Columbus himself showed one native his sword, and the native, never having seen such an instrument before, slid his fingers along the sharp edge and looked startled at his fingers that dripped blood into the sand. Everyone was smiling and so friendly. Close up, we could see how clear and gentle their eyes were, how broad and unusual their foreheads. The captain especially noted and said to one of his men, See the gold in that one's nose? See how docile they are? They will be easy. We will take six back with us to Spain. I think at this, too, my mother would have lowered her eyes. October 16th. So much has happened. There is so much to remember and record, and so much I do not think I want to tell my mother. Perhaps I will keep these letters to myself after all. The natives think we are angels from God. They swim out to us, wave, throw themselves in the sand hold their hands and faces to the sky, and sing and call to us. The crew loves it, and no one loves it better than Columbus. He lifts his open palms to them like a priest at Mass. I sometimes wonder if he doesn't believe these natives himself, just a little bit. They come right out to the ship in swift dugouts that sit forty men, and sometimes as they approach us, the dugout tips. Then in minutes they ride it and begin bailing it out with hollow gourds. All day long the Indians row out to see us, bringing gifts of cotton thread, shell-tipped spears, and even brightly colored parrots that sit on our shoulders and cry out in human voices. For their trouble we give them more worthless beads, bells, and tastes of honey, which they marvel at. The six native men Columbus has taken aboard are not very happy. One by one they are escaping which I cannot help but say I am happy for. One jumped overboard and swam away, and another jumped overboard when a dugout came up alongside us in the darkness. Some of the crew seized another man coming alongside in a dugout and forced him on board. Columbus tried to convince him of our good intentions through sign language and broken words and more gifts of glass beads and junk, and the man rode back to some people on the shore. They stood talking to each other and pointing at our ship. Columbus smiled and was convinced they know we are from God. Me, I am not so sure they will believe it for much longer. December 3rd. We are anchored in a quiet harbor in scattered showers. It has been raining for days without the slightest breeze or gust. 
Many of the men went ashore to wash their clothes and themselves in the river. Two men wandered into the jungle and returned to tell us they had come upon a village where hanging from a post was a basket with a man's head in it. I don't think I will go looking in any baskets I find. One day I went ashore with Diego, Columbus, and a native who was working as an interpreter for us. The captain gave Diego a bag of brass rings, glass beads, and bells, and told him to see what trading he could do. Diego agreed, but I could tell he does not like to do this. A group of natives joined us, but these were not so friendly, and they had little to trade. Their eyes were distrustful, and their bodies were painted red, with bundles of feathers and darts hanging from them. When we finished our meager trade, they gathered at the stern of our small boat in the river, and one began making a speech we could not understand. The others began to shout in response. Columbus stood by, looking pompous and arrogant as he waited, but the interpreter with us turned pale and began to shake. He told the captain to go back to the Santa Maria at once, that they were planning to kill us. I hopped right in the boat to go back, but Diego didn't move, and Columbus laughed. He interrupted the village speechmaker and drew his sword from his scabbard. With a gentle smile on his face, he showed him the steel glistening in the sun, sliced clear through a leather strap the speechmaker bore around his neck, and the man's beads tumbled into the sand. Next, the captain had one of his men demonstrate his crossbow. At this, the crowd of natives turned and ran into the trees. Our interpreter was still not comforted. He jumped into the boat beside me and, trembling, beckoned us to get aboard and get back to the ship, quickly. The captain was slow about it. He talked of how he admired the workmanship of these natives, but how cowardly they were. They are so timid, ten of our men could frighten away thousands of them. I said nothing. The captain expects nothing of me. I just watched silent Diego's back straining and bulging in rhythm as he helped row us back to the Santa Maria. December 13th. It is difficult to keep a journal now that we are so busy, traveling from island to island and up and down rivers and in and out of harbors. There are no longer endless empty jaunts into the western sky. But one thing has not changed. The crew continues to grumble. They are saying this is not Asia at all, that this whole trip has been a costly failure. They say they will be laughed at when we finally return home. There are no silks, no treasures, and just tiny trinkets of gold. All we will bring back are spools of rough cotton thread, a few rustic spears, and some natives who grow quieter and thinner with each day they spend on board the Santa Maria. Columbus goes on naming everything he touches. He sees a cape of land and he says, I christen you Cabo de la Estrella, or Hail Cabo de la Fontante, I name you Cabo del Cinquin, or Isla de la Tortega, and I name you Preto de San Nicolas. I am surprised he doesn't name the birds as they fly by. Every time his feet touch land, he thrusts a cross into the sand and claims it for the king and queen of Spain. The natives no longer greet us with gifts and song. Now when they see us, they run. I am glad for this. Except yesterday, three sailors ran after them and brought back to the ship a most beautiful young girl. Columbus wanted to talk to her and convince her that we are harmless and wish only to trade. There seemed to be an instant tenderness between her and the other native women on board, whom I've written on before. She wanted to take the women with her when she left. Columbus refused, of course, telling her to go back to her people and tell them he means no harm. The women touched hands and spoke to each other in quiet whispers. Once she was gone, the captain turned to me and said, Did you see the gold ring in her nose? The next day he sent a party to search for her in her village, and they found the village, but it had been abandoned. The fires were still warm, but not a soul was tending them. Soon they found people hiding and persuaded them to come out. They reported they even saw the beautiful girl on the shoulders of her husband, but when they returned to the ship, they did not bring gold or silk. More blessed parrots. January 28th. How wonderful this feels to be heading home. We almost made one extra stop. 
one of the natives on board told the captain of an island on our way where only women live, where it is believed men come only part of the year and then are kicked out along with boy children who are old enough to leave their mothers. It was not the women the captain was interested in, but the fact that this may be the island Marco Polo wrote about in his voyage to the Orient, and this would be the proof Columbus needed to show we did indeed make the Indies. He even turned in this direction for two leagues, but when he saw how disappointed the men were, how even the thought of an island full of women did not distract them from their desire to go home, or their uneasiness about the leaking boats, he turned back towards our homeland, and now the ships roll before the winds, winds that grow cooler and cooler with each passing day. February 2nd. Tonight is the night of the full moon, and once again we are traveling through a throbbing meadow of seaweed, this time at a good speed with gentle winds pushing us along. Earlier, I was not able to sleep for the eerie noise the seaweed brings, the soft enchanted swish against the hull, like a mother's hand soothing a baby's head. So I went above and found the captain alone on deck, lit by the moon. His log entries these last days are concerned with the miles we make, and the direction we sail, constantly plotting and striving to find his way back to Spain. I was uncertain at first what to do, but finally I came up beside him. I don't think he had even looked to see who I was, when he pointed off toward the north-northeast and said, I believe there are islands off in that quarter. When we come back on our second voyage, I will make certain we visit them. A second voyage? Suddenly the wind was too cold for me the moon too bright. Below, I wrapped myself tight in my blanket and struggled to write, the inkhorn in one hand, the quill in the other. I try to imagine myself growing to manhood on ships such as this, and I cannot. Oh, I cannot. <laughs>